thank you everyone for coming. Um, this has been a huge effort on our part. Um, welcome to Eureka Talks 2.0. This is only the second year we've done it. Um, but hopefully over the years, as we do it more often, it'll be a bigger success. We'll have a higher turnout. Um, and it's really cool to hear, for students, at least, to hear what you guys are doing behind the classroom and after you leave the classroom. So it's a cool opportunity for us. Um, we're also going to be doing one next semester, hopefully. So if that's something that you're interested in doing, I'll be contacting you in the future about that as well. Um, so the first professor we're going to hear from is Dr. Charles Stocking. So he specializes in archaic and classical Greek literature, especially the Greek epic, Greek religion, ancient athletics, gender in the body in Greece and Rome, and classics and critical theory. So please welcome Dr. Stocking. Thank you everyone for coming. So it's just talk about my research. This is so yeah, so my research uh, focuses primarily, I guess, in uh, ritual politics and the body in Greek culture. And what that means in practical terms really is I work on Greek religion as it's represented in poetry as well as uh, ancient Greek athletics. And these two, Greek religion and Greek athletics, really do go hand in hand in the ancient world. And so a lot of my uh, work is really focused on, we could say, uh, the theology of ancient Greek athletics, sort of the religious logic behind the practices. Um, my first book was on uh, ancient Greek sacrifice, which of course is very much tied into ancient Greek athletics, but is also a constant throughout Greek culture. And this is something which from the modern perspective, we have very little experience with animal sacrifice. We're very removed from the slaughter of the animals that we eat today. And so really that, that project was trying to understand the logic of sacrifice in terms of the value of food and consumption and how it relates to and how the consumption of food uh, relates to one's social status and how access to scarce resources in terms of food actually integrate one into a political economy. But then on the other side with ancient athletics, uh, my focus there is very much personally driven before I became a classics professor, I was also a strength and conditioning coach for UCLA, uh, for a lot of the uh, athletic teams there, and I also worked with a lot of Olympic athletes. So I have a very uh, empirical experience of ancient athletics and the, and the modern Olympics uh, as well. And so a lot of my questions related to ancient athletics are, how can we appreciate and understand ancient athletics? How is it similar and how is it different? Obviously, the ideology of the ancient Olympics has hugely influenced the modern Olympic movement, but a lot of my research there focuses on what are the actual essential differences as well as the similarities. And so related to that, right currently, I am working on a translation of Philostratus's Gymnasticus. It's a very rare text, and it's actually our only text on ancient athletic training from the ancient world. We don't know how the ancients actually trained. We see all the statues of beautiful bodies, but we don't know how they got them. Uh, and this text sort of gives us an account of ancient athletics. And I'm using my background in kinesiology, as well as my background in Greek culture, to understand uh, what this text can tell us about the practice of ancient athletics. And essentially, what's very interesting about it is that uh, not only can it actually account for what I think is an ancient form of modern kinesiology, but it also gives us a lot of account for uh, what we would call the sociology of the body, which is how we train the body and how the training of the body actually reflects one's social status as well. So I'd say that's about it for today. Yeah. There are questions? Is that it? Questions? Yeah. Um, there are a few things. A lot of it is actually, um, there's almost things not to apply, I think. So there's uh, some interesting warning signs in the text about the dangers of an overly rigid uh, training program, for instance, and how uh, overly rigid training can actually lead, in, in this one case they talk about it leading to the death of an athlete. And so there's this actual systematization, uh, and the warnings are that the sort of will to a system can actually be dangerous. And what this author, Philostratus, suggests instead is to train according to an ancient Greek term, kairos, which means the right time. It's sort of this very philosophically loaded term, but, and relates to uh, philosophical performance as well in terms of improvisation. And so I think it actually can give us a hint as to perhaps not relying so much on training as a hard science, 
even in the modern world, but understanding the ways in which there's some degrees of interpretation and a more humanistic side that we can take to it. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Dr. Joyce Bren. Uh, her special interests are second language acquisition, bilingualism, language change, the syntax and acquisition of the language of the Aztec, and syntax. Okay, thank you for inviting me. So I'm a linguist, and currently I'm focusing a great deal on language change. So as uh, you were told, I first trained in, second, in language acquisition, first and second language acquisition, and in order to do that, you have to do a lot of syntax because that's what has to be acquired, and if you don't understand what has to be acquired, you can't explain how it is acquired. The, th the thing that we've discovered in the last 40 years, maybe, is that transmission of language, particularly grammar, not vocabulary, but grammar, through the generations is amazingly stable. So my grandchildren have the same grammar as I do, and I have the same grammar probably as my grandmother had. So over the years, languages stay the same. The, the butterfly effect, you know, that something moves in Brazil and there's a tornado up here, doesn't seem to affect language. So that, of course, takes us to the interesting question, if transmission through the generations of language is so stable, how come languages change so much? Because we know, for example, that English is an Indo-European language that goes to the Indo-European people 3,000 years before Christ. And over the course of that time, English, for example, has become very different from German uh, in word order, for example, or making questions and negation which are very difficult in English, uh, and not so, maybe not so difficult in German. So why do they change if transmission is the same? Uh, people who work in sociolinguistics mainly have an answer for that, and they say there has to be um, a certain uh, social relationship uh, when languages come into contact. So because I study mainly Spanish, uh, let's take the Spanish invasion of America. Uh, because the two languages come into contact and there's immediately a power differential, um, the languages that are under the Spanish will begin to change. Uh, and this sees the problem as a social problem. But because I'm more interested in the representation, the mental representation of languages, I, I think that the first contact actually takes place in the mind of a speaker. Because if there aren't any bilingual speakers, then there's not really any contact. Just because I live next door to somebody who speaks Arabic doesn't mean that there's language contact. I have to learn some Arabic for there to be language contact. And if that is the case, one can ask, okay, children transmit language uh, in a very regular way. Who doesn't transmit language? And you come to second language learners. Second language learners have, as we all know, learning a second language after a certain age is very difficult. So second language learners may be the agents that lead to change. So if you think of it, let's take the social conditions, I mean, I accept them, they have to be there. So let's say the Spanish in, uh, even in Spain, because in Spain, uh, Spanish is in contact with other languages or in Latin America, uh, the social conditions are there, uh, but they would also be an awful lot of second language learners, because if not, there would be no communication. The thing is that the predictions of the social one that says that the languages that would change are the ones that are underneath, and the predictions of second language learners are, actually, are contrary one to the other. So 
the ones, uh, my prediction would be that actually Spanish would change because the indigenous peoples would be learning Spanish, not Spanish people learning the indigenous languages. From the power perspective, it would be the indigenous languages that would change. And of course, they do change in a certain respect due to that because their functions are limited a great deal. They're marginalized, so they don't use it, for example, for poetry and things like that. They're beginning to do that, but for a long time, that is lost. So there are changes that come towards the indigenous, and there's a lot of loss, yeah? Languages disappear. If you're interested in sustainability, you should also take into consideration the number of languages that disappear every year from the face of the earth, never to be recovered, including here in Canada. There are a lot of languages that disappear. So that was, that's one result of contact. Everybody just learns English and the, the indigenous language is gone. But my prediction was that Spanish would change because there would be a lot of indigenous people learning Spanish. So with some students, we've looked at uh, Spain, uh, contact with the Basque country, uh, Peru, contact with Quechua, and Mexico, ca contact with the Aztec, the Nahuatl, which is the language of the Aztecs. And we have found that indeed, Spanish did change in those environments. So where there is a big group of indigenous speakers and a very small group of Spanish speakers, it's actually Spanish that will change. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, the change is not permanent because there's a lot of movement out of these regions to look for work and so on, and then you tend to try and speak like the dominant uh, society. The interesting thing is that I found that not only is Spanish in those regions different, but it's different in the same ways. And that makes me think that maybe Spanish, it's not just that the indigenous language influences Spanish, but rather that there are certain areas where Spanish allows itself to be influenced because of the structure. So there's some areas in which there's a sort of overlap, and then Spanish says, yes, I can transfer this, or no, I cannot transfer that. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> so, questions? Yes? to our lives? I, the, usually being a linguist, unless you, you're into teaching or something, is a pretty useless <laughs> endeavor because all it does is tell us how the mind works, so it's very theoretical questions. But uh, I think that in my case, the, the work that we've done, with, especially in Mexico, uh, has had an effect in two ways, because we have gone to the villages where these languages are spoken, and we're going there asking, so how do you say this? All of a sudden, they find people coming from outside, all the way there to find out how they speak, and they thought that what they spoke was not valuable, yes? And all of a sudden, they say, wait a moment, maybe what we speak is valuable. And I actually did see that, that families would get together and they would discuss, well, they asked me how you say this, and actually, can you say it this other way? And so a discussion was started. The other thing is that we, when I've gone, I've tried to tell people that not only is their language valuable, but if they want to keep it, they have to teach their children. Because what you see very often is that uh, the parents will be talking Nahuatl among themselves, and then they turn to the children and speak Spanish. And of course, they see the future in Spanish because that's how you get a job. But we've tried to tell them, you know, you can be bilingual, speak two languages, and you still have Spanish, so you can still get your job. But not only that, you have something very valuable here, and it's worth passing it on to your children. 
And the only way to do that is to speak to the children in the language. Because if not, it would just join. There are over a million speakers of Nahuatl in Mexico, but they're living in little villages all over the place. So there's very little, uh, they're so separated from each other that there's no contact. So it doesn't feel like a million people. It will feel like 3,000 people in this village. And if they don't speak to their children, the language will disappear even if there are a million. And proportionately to the Mexican population, which is going up, the proportion of people who speak indigenous languages is going down. So even if there's a million people, they're endangered languages. And it would be, can you imagine a language that conquered, because the Aztecs conquered uh, half <laughs> their world, and all of a sudden we just let it go like that? It's, I think it's criminal in a way. Yeah. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to hear from Dr. Kim Solga. Uh, she works in two main areas of contemporary performance studies, early modern performance studies and urban performance studies. When she's not writing about the early modern, she's often writing about cities, what kind of performances happen in cities and how they shape the identities of those of us who live there. Thanks so much, Heather. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Is it okay if I move this mic? I actually don't want to stand behind the podium. Uh, yeah, just take the mic. All right, okay, I'll just, I'll be like the boss, man. Okay, um, thank you guys so much for inviting me and for uh, coming out for this. Um, I'm Kim, I work in the Theater Studies program in the Department of English and Writing Studies, and I wanna say, and give a shout out to the Theater Studies folks in the room, Jonas and Sarah, yeah, let's applaud yourselves, woo! <laughs> and Chelsea and Liz. Um, anybody else do Theater Studies in the room? Right on, okay, welcome. Um, so I was thinking about what I was going to tell you um, and I was driving my brand new car home from Toronto today and I was trying to make it up in my head as I was going along. This is what professors often do on the way to school, by the way, is we make it up as we go along. Um, and I was thinking about the word Eureka and the possibility that I might have had a Eureka moment somewhere along the way that led me to my current research in theater and performance. Because I'm not one of those people who gets up on stage and acts a lot, although I do that sometimes. I don't direct that often, although I do it sometimes. Mostly I sit in my office or I sit in archives and I think about what theater and performance means in the world. So I was thinking about Eureka moments and I realized that all of the Eureka moments I could track in my career were connected to particular performances I'd seen that moved me in some way and that made me think about the way theater and performance do things in our world. So I thought I would tell you about a couple of them. And I just have to say, I've been inspired, by the way, by staring at Einstein for the past few minutes. And he says, imagination is more important than knowledge, according to the lovely banner behind us. And I think I would translate that from my perspective as a theater and performance scholar into imagination is what makes knowledge. That's what happens when we put stuff on stage. We use our imaginations to make new knowledge. So the first Eureka moment I'm gonna tell you about is a performance I saw in England, in London, at the National Theater in 1999 when I was a grad student there. It was called Geometry of Miracles. It's a play by Robert Lepage, who's a Canadian uh, impresario, actor, director, playwright. Has anyone heard of Robert Lepage? I just, thank you, Jonas. <laughs> I will describe him as Cirque du Soleil meets Broadway meets Sundance. Let's say that's Robert Lepage. Chelsea's like, yeah, I totally get it. That's Robert Lepage's aesthetic. The thing that's amazing about a lot of the theater work that Lepage and his company, which is called Ex Machina, make is that they don't just put people on stage to say words and stand next to tables or sit in chairs or what have you. A table is never just a table for Robert, a chair is never just a chair, and a body is never just a vehicle for words or speech or dialogue. All of these things are always multiple things at any one time. He and his company ask the question, what if the table was something else? So there's a fabulous moment in Geometry of Miracles where the company has clearly asked themselves, what if the table was a typewriter? And what if the guy, who's in this case uh, uh, someone playing um, F.C. Johnson, who was the head of Johnson & Johnson. This is a, a play, by the way, about um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, the modernist architect and his life's work. So they've obviously asked, what if the table in this room, in this office that belongs to F.C. Johnson in this scene was a typewriter, 
And what if F.C. Johnson didn't just dictate a letter to his secretary? What if he got up on the table, and as he was dictating it, he tap danced it out? So that's what happens in that scene. F.C. Johnson dictates a letter to his secretary saying, I want Frank Lloyd Wright to come and design my headquarters in Racine, Wisconsin. But he doesn't just do that. He gets, up on the, he gets up on the table, he tap dances, and every letter becomes a gesture with his foot, and the table becomes a typewriter. It's moments like that that make Lepage's work incredibly inspiring for me, and that made me feel, sitting in that audience as a 20-something you know, Canadian going to grad school in London, I felt proud, I felt exhilarated, I felt amazed at the potential of the body on stage. And I remember when the show was over, I leapt to my feet the way people from Canada often do, and I applauded and hooted and hollered along with lots of other people in the audience, but not the people immediately around me. And I remember thinking, well, that's okay, they just lack imagination. Anyway, my next Eureka moment comes from much more recently, and it's actually connected directly to the research I'm doing right now. I'm working on a book just at the minute called Theater and Feminism, which is a teeny tiny book. It's going to be about 80 pages long when it's done. Um, and it's published in a series of other books just like it called Theater and Something. So I was working on theater and feminism this morning, in fact, on the train on my way to Toronto to get my new car. And I was writing about a performance that is my second Eureka moment. It comes from two years ago, and Chelsea knows about it and Liz knows about it. It's a production of a play called A Doll's House that happened in London uh, a couple of years ago and then again last year. And the amazing thing about A Doll's House is that it's an ordinary living room drama by a guy called Heinrich Ibsen. Um, and it's one of those plays where you think, well, these are just people standing around saying words. Nothing much happens. It's a drama about a woman who realizes that she's trapped in a loveless marriage. Her husband thinks that she's a doll. She thinks her kids are just her playthings. She realizes she needs to leave and become a more full and complete human being. The thing that's amazing about this particular production is that the lead actress, Hattie Morahan, who actually visited our class a couple of weeks ago, Hattie embodies this woman, Nora's, experience of going through the realization that she's not happy, that she's not full or complete, and that she needs to be. She needs to leave her husband. This is like 1880-something. She needs to leave her husband. This is monumental. And she goes through this experience in her body. And she does these things with her hands and her face and her body that express the anxiety and the exhilaration and the difficulty, the tension, the trauma, the fear that she's going through. And I remember, just like I remember being in the auditorium at the National Theater watching Robert Lepage, I remember looking at Hattie while I was watching the performance for the first time and seeing what she could tell us with her body. It wasn't her words as Nora telling her husband, I have to leave, that impressed me, that made an impression on me. It was her physicality, the way she showed us that she had no choice but to go. And I remember feeling terrified for her and feeling anxious, and I remember breaking out into an enormous smile at one point, and I remember crying at one point, and I remember realizing again the extraordinary potential of our human bodies to make meaning. You know, this is a moment in time where it's all too easy to say. It's a cliche to say, oh, we have the internet, we have film, theater's dead, who cares about theater? The reason I care about theater is because it's one of the few moments left in our lives, I think, today, where we get to be in a heightened stakes situation with another human being, right there, right now. Hattie is going through something on stage and I'm going through it with her, and there are no screens, there's no virtual anything in between us. We have to take a risk together. She has to risk feeling, and I have to risk feeling. And that's the, the imagination that powers knowledge for me on stage. That's the risk that we take when we make theater, and that's the reason why I believe that theater is actually the future, not the past. Thank you very much, guys. And now, like a good professor, I'll stand by the podium. There we go. Anybody have any questions at all? I'll take questions later at any future time. All you need to do is come visit me in my office. Ask Liz and Chelsea and Jonas and Sarah where it is. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so next we're going to hear from Dr. Servan Woodward. Um, so she specializes in American literature, literature of the 18th century, the novel, French literature of Africa and the Caribbean, visual arts, and theory of art.
I'll, I'll obediently stay by the microphone. I also, oh, I, I'm doing two plays this year for those of you guys who want to do, uh, there is some English, uh, English roles too, big roles, small roles. I'm looking for actors desperately. And here is a painting that I'm going to circulate. If you have the transparency, you have better luck. It's by a minor painter. Uh, it's a minor painter because he paints so small that his painting is hardly any bigger than what you're holding right there. However, um, he has high ambitions. He had high ambitions. He wanted to be a history painter, which meant he would have had paintings about at least the size of those double doors. And uh, he had to paint on very tiny scale because he was accepted to the academy, but as a painter of flower and fruits. Um, in a roundabout way, that painting is related to comedy and to uh, painting because in the background is a painting on the wall, the back of the wall, is a painting that his um, instructor gave him, an academician painter, his name was Koipel, and he was a history painter. So he had a history painter teach him, and he expected to become a history painter, but he became a genre painter for fruits and flowers. It includes interior scenes, as you can see. So you can put human beings, but they can't be historical or mythological or Greek history, or as this person is doing, it has to be, you know, just tiny little scenes. And it is. It's his second wife. The first one uh, died probably in childbirth. We don't know about these details because private matters were very private in those days. And uh, it's his second wife that uh, is playing a new gadget, which is called uh, a bird organ. And so you turn the little handle, and it imitates a bird song, and it teaches the bird how to sing. And it's called la surinette. Surinette has a et diminutive. Surin is the bird, which is... Uh, well, it can be several birds, but anyway, so that's a um, yellow bird that you see in the cage. However, uh, it's an illustration of a Baroque painting for several reasons, because it's in echo with several things. You don't know who the serenette is eventually. Is it the machine? Or is it the lady playing at being the little bird, and as a female little counterpart of the little bird, which is a serin? Eventually, uh, who says the little bird is male anyway, so it could also be a surinette. So maybe we have three surinettes in this painting, which is the little male bird or female bird. The machine, that's called surinette, and the lady, who with a little round hat and long shawl is imitating, kind of imitating a bird. <laughs> and uh, she might be sitting on top of a big cage of a skirt. In some of the paintings, there are three versions of this. Some of the painting, the cage and the skirt pretty much look like the same type of balloon. So you wonder if she's in her mind playing at being, you know, like crazy lady, you know, playing at being the bird through the little machine ventriloq, you know, as a ventriloquist uh, system to talk to, his, to her bird. And so uh, she's fancying herself a bird. All right. So that would be Baroque in the sense that there is... Um, a mixing of genres. You have a machine, a bird, and a woman that are somewhat, you know, rotating status in here. Uh, is she trying to become a bird? Is she trying to become uh, a bird through the machine? Is the bird addressing the machine back or the lady through the machine or the lady because of the machine? We don't know. Every category is kind of mixed up, which in classical art is not very... Um, acceptable because you're supposed to have, you know, animals in one category, women, I guess, in another one, important men in another, important ladies in another. They're conditions. As you can see, you can't paint on any kind of size, any type of topic. So, you know, borders are pretty important here. Now, if you do something which is not quite allowed in 18th century studies, which is to consult with um, modern theoreticians, because of several problems that will occur, including folding uh, 19th and 20th century uh, philosophy back onto the 18th century, which is kind of a historical problem. You should take historical tools of the 18th century to analyze the 18th century, kind of. Anyways, but if you still go there, because we are curious beings, you find odd things happening. And um, one of them is if you take feminism, 
uh, Simone de Beauvoir and maybe even other people, uh, what they say is that women are not women, are not born women, they become women. And they become locked in the domestic space. Definitely, she's locked in that domestic space. She's against a wall with a closed window, the bird is in a cage, and it's a domestic scene. And besides, Chardin himself is locked into domestic scenes, flowers and fruits in his kitchen. So he's part of it. And he wanted to be part of the public sphere, which was what's in the back, you know, which is these, uh, these historical paintings. And to a certain point, he is there because you see in the back, it's a painting by his, it's been recognized as, we can't quite see it there, but it's been identified as a painting chasing away the muse of comedy. And in this sense, he, on his small scale, not a mythological scale, is making us laugh because he's got this crazy wife that fancies herself a bird through a funny machine and is probably creating some kind of din in there. And they're all expecting with this huge means, you know, disguised machine, etc., buying the cage, feeding the bird, a song from the bird, a song that might not come, but for sure might come from the people walking by as they laugh because the piece is comical and may be more efficient in its tiny little, um, you know, scale than a huge broad painting that was possibly not that comical about you know the muse of painting winning over the muse of comedy so in a certain sense he won a kind of a strong arm battle on this tiny little scale the way we expect a huge sound from that tiny little bird although he might not sing he probably will not sing because he's on the painting anyway so that's where i stand if you have any questions Thank you. Uh, so our last speaker is uh, a PhD student, um, Leif Shenstead Harris. Um, he's in the Department of English. His research interests include ghosts, haunting, silences, intensities, loss, mourning, and absence, as well as Anglo-Caribbean, Anglo-South African, and African or Irish literatures, affirmative deconstruction, transnational poetics, the global Gothic and the weird, and the ecstatic identities. So uh, as a graduate student, I, of course, overprepared. The alternative when you're a graduate student is to underprepare, of course. Um, and I did it last minute, as every grad student will do. Uh, the other thing that I'm going to do is not just talk about what I research, but also how, uh, because I'm sort of the transition point between where you guys are and where you guys are. So a little bit of both. So anyway, uh, into the talk. So when people ask what I do, which seems to happen more and more frequently as I get older, as if I'm closer to some kind of idea of purpose or truth, um, as if age would make someone wiser, uh, they're often unsatisfied when I tell them that I study ghosts. In response to telling someone that, I get raised eyebrows, quizzical looks, silences. Um, if someone's friendly, maybe they'll give me a, con a confused smile, but they won't ask a lot of questions. If I tell them that I'm a graduate student in English, their face will clear up, they'll smile, and they'll walk away. The conversation is effectively over, as if I said something meaningful that answers the questions that they had about what it is that I do. Maybe they assume that all graduate students are strange, ghosts, and disconnected from reality, and they don't want to startle me with too many questions from the outside world. We usually move on. I don't explain what it might mean to study ghosts. And nobody asks me what being a graduate student has to do with this idea of the supernatural, the preternatural, what it might mean. Sometimes I'll throw out disciplinary fields. This is a bad habit. I'll say, I study South African and Irish literature. The conversation will drift away. Ireland, Africa, the Caribbean, all of these are very far away from Canada sometimes. Sometimes somebody tells me about a time when they think they've seen a ghost. It's interesting, but it's very far from talking about research. Let me tell you something about ghosts. A long time ago, ghosts were absolutely terrifying. Spectral forms were these half explanations for the seemingly permeable boundary between things that were visible and things that weren't, between things that you knew and things that you had no clue about. Linguists will explain that the ghost's etymological history dates back to the Germanic, the word ghast, a seeming cognate for the Old Norse geisa, a word which means rage. 
Sometimes they'll also connect it to the Gothic word usgeisen, meaning to terrify. All li linguistic derivatives suggest that ghast, geyser, usgeisen, and other words for ghost have much to do with the wound or with the tear, something that has been pulled to pieces, something torn from the fabric of what once was whole. Ghosts. Today, they mean something similar. Stories about ghosts express personal loss and historical wounds. For the people who write about them, ghosts signify lingering doubts, residual fury, and a fundamental ambivalence toward the things which are present and the things which are at the same time while present, totally absent from the world. In our normal lives, the metaphor of being haunted is so deeply ingrained in our everyday vocabularies that we often forget those places from which the idea gains its visceral force, the times when the ghosts of lost people or the forgotten ideas or the past selves of people we once were come back to haunt us, the events and the emotions which drive writers to literature. To be haunted means that the fury of a wound or the despair of loss somehow survives in a person or in a story. That surviving thing which is no longer there is, for the lack of a better word, a ghost. So what I do is I research the ways in the media in which this language of loss and this language of fury comes to life. How do you research ghosts? How does a person study them? How did this whole program of studies begin? I came to studying hauntings through a mixture of curiosity and disciplinary rigor, although I'm sure that some people will say that I'm not disciplined enough. Um, along each step of the path that has led to my education to date, my projects have spun from what seemed like side interests, material in which I took no classes, subjects in which there was no one to give me the answers. Graduate school is a process of narrowing focus. Each class becomes more and more specialized. But as that process happened, I found that the spaces in between the subjects became increasingly inviting for research and for the eventual connection with the broad network of scholars which crosses the academic world. So each phase of research is characterized by a previously intriguing suggestion from somewhere, perhaps an author's name, Braden Bradenbach, whose name is that? A recurring metaphor, why do we say that we're haunted all the time? A cultural idiosyncrasy, how is it that ghosts look and why do they look like that? Or a national tendency, why do some languages adopt this language well? other languages simply reject the, the supernatural altogether. So it comes from this suggestion as well as the privilege to study it which you garner through scholarship applications and of course going to the next phase of, of research. Like most graduate students, I'm here because I have serious questions about how humans express themselves and about the forms of expressions we use. These questions usually take shape by searching and felicity. Uh, my research moves ahead by closely examining multiple items of seemingly totally disparate phenomena. South African plays, an exiled Irishman's poetry and television experiments, poetry by Guyanese writers who now live in England that deal with late 18th century insurance claims. And then I rigorously search for this connection that threads the story between them. Ghosts are a case in point. So in terms of its objects, my research takes up plays as different as Ghanaian writer Ama Ada Aidu's Dilemma of a Ghost, Irish modernist J.M. Singh's Riders to the Sea, fellow Irish playwright Conor McPherson's The Weir, and the South African play Siswe Banzi is Dead, a collaborative work between three people. On the face of it, these plays are vastly different in context and in content. Dilemma of a Ghost is a play about an African-American who comes to Ghana expecting a different reception to the one that she finds. In Riders to the Sea, an impoverished family in the far reaches of Ireland mourns the dead of the last of the family's sons. Self-exiled Irishman Sam Beckett, who of course everyone knows by waiting for Godot, turned to strange and ghostly teleplays in the twilight of his long life. On another continent, but not so far away, Siswe Banzi is Dead tells a harrowing story about a man who steals the identity card from a dead man in order to take up a new identity and find better work prospects. What unites these plays is a shared investment in the way that ghosts mediate human relationships across time, space, and writing. In McPherson's The Weir, for instance, a play where a number of people sit around a pub drinking and talking, nothing happens, one person goes out to the bathroom at one point, it's not an action-packed play. Um, one man's story about a ghost road 
leads to a number of ghost stories told with increasing seriousness. By the end of the play, a woman has revealed her deep trauma after losing her only child, who she feels is calling her. Another man has confessed to an old romantic partner whom he has never forgotten, as if he said the ghost of her is in every room that he is also in. He's also single. Always single, it seems. He's a 40-year-old man who has no prospects in life other than this story. From the folktale about ghosts, these characters reveal a depth and richness of human experience by telling increasingly real ghost stories. Perhaps unsurprisingly, ghosts are present in poetry as well. As in drama, they make for an element of cross-cultural comparison and interest. It is in poetry where the frontiers of ghost research, if we can call it that, can be found. As human bodies disappear from technological media, such as writing or television, and as the bureaucratic regimes which regulate society become increasingly arcane or convoluted, writers turn to figures that resist these systems of control or these systems of organized expression. Their aims might be artistic, political, social. The possibilities offered by ghosts are manifold. But under it all, the original meaning of ghost lurks. That rage, terror, or wound is still a primal force under the language of hauntings as it occurs in poetry. Sometimes writers turn this lingering force into a power beyond the reach of their individual means. In his 1973 memoir, A Season in Paradise, Afrikaans poet Braden Bradenbach wrote that we South Africans, we will go on haunting the world forever. For the South African poet, this was both a threat and a lament, an idea as sharp as a knife that would go on to inform much of his poetry and critical writings to come. It is this feeling that motivates my research in contemporary literatures, especially in poetry, seemingly the most abstract and yet the most intense of literary genres. Poetry is where ghosts are most easy, easily seen. So to close, research is a constant process of challenge, consolidation, and learning. I began my program of doctoral studies convinced that prose was my field and knowing that novels would serve as my object of study. I was wrong. It happens all the time. I'm always wrong. Ghosts led me into fields more effervescent than prose and into places where the imagination gains a foothold over the human body, into poetry and drama, respectively. This serendipity was true for my master's research as well. I began the degree thinking about science fiction, dystopia, and architecture. I ended the degree having written a dissertation on representations of libraries in the fictions of Borges, Michael Ondaatje, Ian McEwan, and Thomas Wharton. Only at the end of the PhD, as I finalize sections of my dissertations in these months, do I find that my interest in prose has resurfaced, and I'm beginning to plan research on spectrality in novels, short stories, and prose more generally. In my master's year, I learned that research at the graduate student level is a compromise between you, the student, your advisor, and the forms of production which you are asked to complete in order to gain your degree. In the PhD years, I have learned that research is also a compromise between the interests that you know about and the very many, very specialized fields of interest which graduate research reveals and which become things that you are passionate about. As a graduate student, one's research is always this process of challenging yourself through an exposure to new ideas, consolidating what you know and how you know it, and then learning about contiguous and related areas of study. For me, ghosts are a point of cross-cultural comparison which help to connect different fields of research, namely the contemporary literatures of South Africa, Ireland, and the Anglophone Caribbean. They are also almost a primal metaphor of language and a way to speak for the things for which there are no other words. So, to introduce myself, my name is Leif Shenstedt Harris. I'm a PhD student here in the Department of English, in addition to being contract faculty for the year, and you can look that up, and I study ghosts. So, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks.